Wednesday in the spring when Mr. Bonner comes to visit. And um, today is that special day. So without any delay, I'd like to introduce you to one of our student ambassadors in the London Center for Retailing, Kimberly Jewell. And she's going to get the show started. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm aptly wired here, so I don't need a handheld, because I got a, both sides of me lit up. <laughs> so I should, be, I should be all set. But thanks, um, Drew, and uh, for revealing uh, what you do for a living at, at Macy's. There are lots of different job opportunities in the, in the store line role is the, the largest uh, of, uh, of where we employ recent ca uh, college graduates. Uh, and thank you, Kimberly, for, for that, that introduction. Um, so I'm going I'm, to, and I want to welcome the, the, the Norton Board of Advisors who are, who are here today, so in the front row, and uh, thank you all for being here. And so, Dr. Soyam Sim is, is here as well. There she is, right in, right in front. And I want to thank Belinda Burke always uh, for all the work she does here at the school and, and uh, for inviting me to speak, speak today. Uh, I'm going to um, talk about uh, a subject that uh, we really worked hard on over the last couple of years. It's called My Macy's. Uh, I'm going to give you sort of an overview first about, uh, about the company, about what, what our company looks like and is today, uh, but then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about a big initiative that we did uh, just recently, um, which I hope you'll find, find interesting because for all this time that I've been in this business, which is a long time, 
uh, it's probably been the most exciting year of my career this past year and the most fun year. So in spite of all of the challenges that we've faced. So let me talk about that. First, um, about 151 years ago and a half to be exact, uh, Macy's, uh, you know, came on the scene in America. So uh, we have a long, long uh, history uh, yeah, starting in, in, in New York City with the original uh, Macy's store, obviously uh, no internet because there was no electricity. So we, we, had, we had our own set of challenges back then. Um, and about 14 years later, Bloomingdale's uh, first store uh, you know, came about also in New York City in the location where it's at today on 59th and Lexington. And, um, uh, and, and so they had their challenges obviously back in that time, still no, no telephone had been created at that point. And then I'm going to not take you through every year up until now, uh, so you probably appreciate that. Uh, so we'll just skip forward about 123 years to, to 1995, uh, and then all of a sudden we've got, uh, not all of a sudden, but 149 uh, Macy stores by then and 18 Bloomingdale's uh, stores. This is when I went back to um, join the company. It was called Federated Department Stores back then. I actually left the company for six years when our company was taken over in, uh, and then in, uh, by a Canadian developer called Robert Campo and I left at that time. I was actually president of Bullock's Wilshire in Los Angeles which was part of Federated and I went to, to work for Neiman Marcus and I became the CEO of Neiman Marcus uh, and I was there from 88 to 1994 but I came back uh, in 1994 and, and this is what our company looked like when I came, when I came back. Uh, and so we had a um, we had a lot of uh, work to do. So you you know think about that because most of you students, I'm guessing, are about five years old about that time. Uh, you know, you just graduated from preschool. You know, so you're really get, making that big move into you know kindergarten. And so uh, <laughs> so you can kind of relate. So so it was uh, it was a wasn't didn't take much longer. Only ten years later, and and look what happened to the company. So we really leaped forward. Um, uh, much through acquisition, uh, but uh, we expanded the brand and expanded the name plates, and we are now at over 400 uh, Macy stores and and up to uh, 36 uh, um, 30, 36 uh, Bloomingdale stores. Obviously, no Twitter, not much of uh, a lot of things. And then, but just kind of flashing back and taking a, a look at all these are all, and there's many, many more brands that are are part of our, our of our company today, but these brands no longer exist. So, so all of these names have been changed uh, to either the Macy's name or the Bloomingdale's uh, name. But if you look at all these names, they're all family-owned companies. You know, uh, when, when, you, when you look at John Wanamaker, he was a person. You know, R.H. Macy was a person. All of these companies, for the most part, are 90 percent of them, Ralph Lazarus, these, these were family-owned companies. And they were all based, the department stores, in all these, the major cities around, uh, around America. Uh, and they worked very well for a long, long time. Um, but you know, as roads began to be built and suburban, uh, suburban you know, homes and, and markets began to be created and people started moving out of the downtown and away into the suburbs, you know, these business models had to change. And, and as time went on, you know, competing against national retailers, these, these regional stores became more challenged you know, to, to compete with national chains when they were just marketing uh, locally. Uh, and so, so that was really what was, was the stimulus behind us needing to become a bigger national uh, a brand in, in our case. Um, and so if you look back about, you know, last, uh, you know, 50 years, there's about 75 different name plates that are our old sto stores that are now called Macy's or Bloomingdale. So many, many stores have changed the, the names under this one Macy's uh, powerful name. And that's what we've moved to. So we, we have all these names have moved to two brands, Macy's and Bloomingdale's, with 90% of the stores in the, in the business uh, being under the Macy's, Macy's brand name. And I'll show you a, a slide about that 
in a second, but today the company's last year's uh, sales revenues were $23.5 billion, um, 850 stores, 800 plus Macy's and 40 uh, one, uh, Bloomingdale stores, about 160,000 employees in, in, our, in our company. We trade under the symbol of M. That was another fun story. We, we were, we were uh, trading under uh, FD, we were federated department stores, and, and after we had made all these name changes and brought the, the, name under, the, the company under these two name plates, it didn't make sense to be called federated anymore as a corporation. So I went to the uh, president of the New York Stock Exchange and I said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about changing the name of the corporation and to change all the names of these stores, so it makes sense to me to change the name of the corporation from federated to Macy's, Macy's Inc. He said, that's great, congratulations. I said, yeah, I can't have FD as my initials to trade under, okay? I need the letter M. He goes, well, you can't have the letter M. I said, what do you mean I can't have the letter M? No one's using it. He said, yeah, but I'm saving it for Microsoft. <laughs> I said, Microsoft isn't going to go to the New York Stock Exchange. You've got to be kidding me. You think they're going to move over, you know, and from the NASDAQ? And the, they're all the technology firms are on the NASDAQ. Why are they going to move? And she said, oh, yeah, well, they probably aren't going to move, but I don't, I don't want to take that hope away. <laughs> Year later, we got the M. So it was a persistent battle to get it, but we, we, we ended up convincing him that he was out of his mind, uh, basically. So... Uh, so that's what we have today, uh, 810 Macy's, uh, you know, as, as you see in 40, 40 Bloomingdale's. We also have Macy's.com and Bloomingdale's.com, which is a fabulous business for us. Uh, last year we did over a billion dollars in sales just on our internet uh, site. So, so uh, fast and, and, and growing in the, in, on, the, on the online business. Um, and, and we opened our first international store this year in February. We opened uh, a Bloomingdale store in Dubai. And uh, in fact, I'm going in three weeks to, uh, back to, to, to Dubai. To, to, for, to see our store there and uh, it's very upscale, very high end and actually doing very well in a troubled economy. You know, as we've had a troubled economy, you know, Dubai, big tourist, you know, uh, country, lots of Russia and, and Europeans frequenting that, uh, that part of the world. Um, that, that business really slowed down but our store just opened and, and, and uh, off to a very good start so far. Probably do $100 million in sales our first year in, in that one store and, and so I'm actually going to go look in Abu Dhabi and other places as well for potential other Bloomingdale's and perhaps Macy's uh, locations. Um, and so what we look at, the way we look at our customers is, is really with a 360 degree uh, view of, uh, of, of you know, who our customer is and, and how we can reach them and communicate uh, with our customers. Um, you know, we want to look at, we want the customers to shop in our stores, we want them to shop online, and if we end up getting into other categories of, 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 of merchandising, marketing, messaging, we want that too. So we want to communicate with our customers in every direction and make sure uh, that, that we're maximizing our potential with each one. And, and a very important statistic here to kind of put this into perspective you know, uh, for, for you. For every dollar spent uh, for the online customer, if, if we can get that customer into the store, she'll, she, she, she's $5.77 of business is influenced in our stores once she's, once she's already been activated online. So this combination is really powerful. Uh, and, and typically when a customer returns something, because uh, you know, when you buy something in a catalog, you buy something online, you re the return rate goes up much, much higher, and that makes sense, right? Because you haven't tried it on, and you know, the color might be different or something like that. That's normal. That's a normal, normal state of things. So, so when, when things get returned, we tell customers, please take it back to our stores if you can. And we'll give you the shipping materials, but we'd rather you take it back to our stores. And that's something that Amazon can't do, or that's something that eBay can't do, or that's something, you know, it's, not, it's, it's where you have, you, you can do it when you have both bricks and mortar and online biz as a business. And so, we we embrace that because typically when she turns when she when she buys a hundred dollars online and she takes it back to the stores for return she'll spend hundred and thirty dollars that day you know in the store so so almost always it turns into a positive you know transaction so this view of the customer from a, from a uh, uh, a 360 degree angle is important. This next slide kind of shows you, you know, the breakdown. Because people say, well, why do you need Bloomingdale's and Macy's? Well, they're very different customers. You know, that's the primary, primary reason. Just like Target is very different than Nordstrom's. You know, they're, they're very different, very different customers. And you know, what I've got here is a chart that shows, you know, the fashion access on, on one side and then the affordability on, on the, lower, uh, the lower access. And, and so there's more customers here. You know, the, and the 
circle, by the way, represents the size of the business. You know, the, the white one here, that's about a $5 billion business. So you can see like, like Bonton and, and Belks and people like that are about $5 billion in business. So as the circle gets bigger, you know, so does the volume. And so we're the third largest after Walmart and Target on this largest department store, but the third of the, all, the, all these retailers that, that are grouped here. And, and you see, you know, if you want more basic inventory, you know, if you want replenishable socks and underwear, t-shirts and things like that, you know, that's, that's low on the fashion, fashion scale. And if you want price, you know, very inexpensive, just, just lowest price possible is over here. If you want high, high quality and high, high fashion, you're going to be in that top right corner. NMG is Neiman Marcus Group. They own Bergdorf Goodman, you know, very, very high. high. And so that's kind of how it breaks down. And there really truly is a difference in quality between those price points up there and over here. Uh, and I know that because I'm in the business and I watch, it, I watch the product being, being, being made. Uh, but, but for some customers, it doesn't really matter. You know, they just want you know, to wear a shirt. So that's okay for them. So they're happy to shop in this zone over here. So it har it's much harder to be good up in this top corner, because particularly up in the high part, because that means you have to understand fashion. You have to understand what customers are going to want next season, because you're buying these things between three and, and, and nine months in advance. And so you have to kind of predict where it's going to go. And if you're wrong, you know, you're stuck with a lot of inventory. So, so that's kind of how the chart breaks down. And you can see Bloomingdale's is much more, the, much more contemporary, higher end, higher quality. If we sell the same products, you know, we sell Estee Lauder lipstick, it's the same price in all of these stores that sell Estee Lauder lipstick. But we would choose to sell you know, Armani suits, Giorgio Armani suits for $2,000 or $3,500 for men's suit for, at Bloomingdale's, whereas Macy's would, would sell uh, a Hugo Boss you know, suit would maybe sell for $500 or a private brand suit to sell for $200. So we have those ranges and there is, like I say, a difference in, in quality, but uh, in, from, from a distance it looks, they both look great. Uh, and so, so as a retailer, you have to choose your lane. You know, you have to choose. You know, where you're going to be and where you're going to play in. And 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 there, are, as I said, there are more customers down at the lower income uh, level, uh, but there's also you know more competition down there. Um, so. You know, no matter what lane you were in in 2009, boy, we, had, we all had a tough year. I mean, in any, you know, most businesses, but certainly if you're in a consumer-oriented business like, like ours, where everything's optional, everything we sell is not required, you know, it's not like food or air or stuff like that, uh, you know, you, we, it, it was a challenging business. And, and in our case, in us and Kohl's and guys like that, we actually had among the best performance in our, in our sector of all those places. We were down 4 to 5 percent, and then the, the high-end guys, like like Neiman Marcus and Saks in that top corner, Nordstrom, they were down 20%. So really, really tough, tough business uh, environment in 2009. Um, uh, but, uh, and I could, you know, I think a lot of the headwinds that we all faced in 2009 are still there. You know, we, we have close to 10% 10, 10 unemployment. Uh, it's got to be that in Tucson in that, in that range. You know, it's, we, we have economic uh, situation here with, where, where consumer credit's getting tighter. It's not getting better. We're tightening credit, credit card you know, debt. When you pay down from $500, you had a $500 limit, and you pay it down to $200, don't be surprised if the bank lowers your limit to $200 because they're just going to get the risk off of their you know, plate. Uh, as opposed to you know f funding opportunities, so things have really tightened up and really changed. And so now I could spend all my time talking about that stuff, but I don't control any of that. So I'm not going to spend my time talking about. It. I'm going to instead try to tell you about some of the things that I think we've done, you know, in this past year to try to address the challenges of 2009 and kind of set us set ourselves up for 2010 and beyond. So about. Middle of 2000 and uh, into 2008, September, is when Lehman Brothers collapsed and Merrill Lynch was swallowed up by Bank of America all in one weekend. And right about then, everybody kind of said, what? Something's going on here. And, and, and you know, the, the, the market started to fall. You know, stock market crashed. You know, uh, the, everything kind of tightened at the, same, at the same time. And it didn't take long uh, for people like us because we, you know, we, we get invited to the White House all the time. I get invited all the time because we, we, I was there last week. And the reason was because we have our finger on the pulse of the consumer. That we know before the White House knows, you know, how the consumer is doing. Because we watch consumers every day. We look at it by hour. I can tell you by hour how our sales are performing in Ralph Lauren and Tucson Mall. 
You know, so I don't want to know that, but I can know that. It's, and some people know that. They want to know that. I don't need to know that, but I'm telling you, we can know that. So, so we have all this data and information about keeping our finger on the pulse of the consumer, and the consumer just wasn't feeling very good in the end of 2008. And so we could see very clearly with what was happening in front of us and with unemployment you know, starting to rise and the, and the like, it wasn't going to get better in 2009. It was pretty clear to see that for, for consumer-oriented businesses like ours. So, so we decided to get, get aggressive and take, take steps and make changes to get in front of this as much as we possibly can. And our belief was that 2009 was going to be a, such a troubled and challenging year. Let's make every change we've ever dreamed about, thought about, smelled, thought, you know, anything that came to our Ed, do it all in 2009 because we're not going to have a good year anyway. So let's just get it done and get it in so, so that when the consumer com comes back, that we'll be in position to take advantage and, and grow market share. And, and that's really how we thought about it in a very aggressive uh, way. So, long story short, uh, we announced uh, uh, one step in, uh, a year and a half ago and, and, and the other step uh, a year and uh, a couple of months ago uh, and where, where we went from seven divisions, operating divisions, where I had buyers in seven cities across America and planners, seven cities and marketing executives in seven cities across the country. And uh, we consolidated that down in two steps down to one. And in 2009 was the biggest change in, in, our, in our company in the last 50 years, without question. So we, we, we ended up consolidating out 7,000 jobs in all of these different locations and, and, and we added 1,600 jobs all around the country in, an, in a new structure called My Macy's and the new structure what it did was you know, the, as we consolidated down these divisions buyers ended up having responsibility for somewhere between 100 and 200 stores that they were buying for and planning executives between 100 and 200 stores that they were trying to figure out. Well you know you just can't do that. You know Bloomingdale's can do that because they have four 40 stores. Neiman Marcus can do that, they have 40 stores. You know, Saks is, you know, they're on the edge, they, they've got 50 stores. You know, when you have 200 stores, you don't know the store manager's name in every single one of your stores. You certainly don't know your best salespeople. And that's where you can get a lot of great information. So, so when you start to lose touch like that, you know, it, it becomes a challenge for us. So, when, so even though we had these seven divisions, they really weren't in touch with the, the customer, except for the customers that were in the cities where they were, they were operating out of. So, so this is true for all, all retailers of our size. So what we did was we replaced that structure which with, with this district structure of 69 small districts that ended up having you know, uh, uh, 18 or 20 people in each district. And it had a district vice president, had district merchants for women's apparel, had district merchants for men's apparel, had district merchants for, for home furnishings, all the different categories. And then we had a planning executive, a district planner for all those places as well. And no one had ever done this in our, in our business before. We drew, we drew this up on, you know, just in terms of thinking through strategy, just what could we do to get back to becoming locally relevant with our customers? And the answer was, cut down the span of control. Make it so that, like when I was a buyer, a hundred years ago, when I was a buyer and I lived in LA and my stores were all throughout Southern California, I had a problem, the store manager, store manager or the department manager would call me and I knew her name and I knew his name and, and they'd say, I got a problem in South Coast Plaza, I got no inventory in this, this particular pattern uh, and, and I would get in my car and I'd drive to Lakewood, you know, we'd have a handwritten transfer, I'd put the inventory in the back of my Volkswagen, I'd drive to South Coast Plaza, I'd drop it off, problem solved, you know? And it sounds like, what are you thinking? That's crazy. It was easy. It was simple. It was no problem. And you know, I got lots of sales at, in South Coast Plaza as a result of that little uh, you know, thing we were doing. So how do we get, you know, with, with today's technology, how do we reinvent that? And that's kind of what we did. That's kind of what we did really. We, we get, so I get 18 or 20 people living in the city in going into every one of these 10 or, they only have 10 or 12 stores, every one of them. They're in, they have no reason not to be in every one of their stores every other week. Knowing the details about what's missing, knowing the sizes that their customers require, and knowing what we're out of stock on. And there's no computer technology that will tell you what the customer came in for that you did not have. There's no technology that tells you that. Human beings tell you that. You know, so, so it was really, it, was, it, was, it, was, it made a lot of sense to us on paper, certainly. Um, 
but the key was now to execute it. So it was a little early. Frankly, we didn't really have as much of the testing done as I felt we needed to have, te have done before we'd make that big change. But when, I, when, when fall of 2008 came along and, and all this you know, headwind was in front of us, I said, you know what, we're going, guys. We're just gonna, we're gonna go. We don't have all the research. We don't have all the answers. It's not perfect, but it's better than the status quo because the status quo is not gonna work. That's not gonna get us anywhere. So we had to make this plunge and make this change. And, uh, and uh, you know, but the, the, big, the big idea was, okay, we got this big, powerful national brand. Everybody knows Macy's brand. You've seen the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It's the third largest parade in, in, in th third, third largest parade. It's the, it's the third uh, most watched television program after the Academy Awards and the Super Bowl. You know, so pretty powerful brand. One problem. I wasn't national. I couldn't even advertise on it. So, you know, by becoming a national brand, we were able to, to be participate in, in that brand, brand awareness. But once we got that, we still were not doing a great job of being locally relevant to your customers in Tucson uh, when we were trying to buy from San Francisco. We were buying the Tucson products out of San Francisco. You know, and so, so now we're buying the Tucson products as well, the other 800 stores out of New York City, but I got people living in Phoenix who are in this market every other week. And they know what your customers are looking for in, this particular, in these particular stores. And so it's a huge change for us. And the big objective was just that, you know, um, take this big national brand, uh, make it locally relevant to, to our consumers, uh, and, and set up these, the, these, uh, these districts. And we did it in two phases. I set up this first, this, uh, 20 districts first in just a part of the country where we did our first consolidations. And those 20 districts just killed the rest of the, of the nation in terms of performance. They just really took off. And in fact, last year, 12, the top 12 of my 69 districts, the top 12 were all the initial pilot districts of the initial 20. So it, we knew it worked. You know, we knew that we were, we were connecting with consumers and making real progress here. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and it was exciting to see. Cause, and, and, and so we're, we're uh, we were concerned, you know, about all this just disruption and all these changes and how, you know, how we were going to live through 2009. But like I said, it was going to be a tough year no matter what. So why not make all these changes? And, and the, 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 the great news was, was that we, we did have a challenging year in 2009, but we really had a challenging three quarters, you know, February through November was, was challenging and, and we made no money, our company made no money for the first nine months of the year. Uh, the good news is, is if you're going to have a good quarter, you should be the fourth quarter in the retail business and we had a great fourth quarter. Yeah, just unbelievable. We made more money in the fourth quarter than we made the entire year before in 2008. And so everybody was just blown away by the results, the sales were good, the profits were good, and it, but it all came in December and January and just totally turned the whole thing around. And so February, you know, uh, we, 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 we kept on going. And the only, the only stores that did actually outperformed us were the stores that had a really tough year the year before. And, you know, and it, even our own Bloomingdale's uh, business did even better than this uh, be, because it, the, the, the high-end guys got hit so hard the year before that they had a bit of an easier, easier comeback. But on our size base, which is much bigger than Nordstrom's or Neiman's combined even, it would, to have that, that 3.7 increase in February was very positive. And tomorrow morning, you'll read about March results uh, for us and, and for others. So, so uh, we feel terrific about the progress that we've made and the things that are, that are, that are happening here and, and, uh, and again, particularly about those early stores, the original 20 that we set up really took off and outperformed the rest of the nation because of this local effort because they were representing the voice of the customer. And it is all about localization. Um, it really is such an important subject, you know, f for us. And and, uh, and and our goal. I mean, when I talk about my Macy's, what that means is, is I want every customer to walk into our stores, no matter what city they're in, and say, "This is my Macy's." You guys really get 
who I am, and you, you know, this, this, you really are understanding who, I, who, you know, who your customer is in this particular store in this particular market. That's that's what my Macy's is is all about, and and uh, you know, you can imagine, you know, your store, what, what your customers are looking for, what you are looking for in, in stores in Tucson, very different than what customers are looking for in New York City, very different than what they're looking for in Boston, very different than what they're looking for in San Francisco, and so we have to make sure that we understand all of those uniquenesses, and we now have finally got the capability of doing that. I think the, the stores that we're now going to be able to compete with are the local stores. You know, the stores that have 10 or 5 or 8 stores in a city that really are understanding. We're going we're gonna to be able to compete with like In-N-Out Burger. You know, because In-N-Out Burger to me is the epitome. In-N-Out Burger is a great burger, okay? That is a great burger. But they're very focused. They know exactly what they want. And they ref I wanted to open them in New York. I was, I was ready to put them all my, my money aside and say, I'm going to invest in the In-N-Out oh, in Burger. These guys are so focused, they just want to make sure they can drive to all of their stores. So they're only going to be on the Southern California, Arizona, Nevada. That's it. And they're very focused that, that way. I think give them a lot of credit. So now we have that same ability with just, uh, I'm not going to sell burgers, but <laughs> very focused and have, have uh, people living in these markets who really understand the customer and the needs of the market. And that's a big, big differentiator for us, and, and none of our competitors have this. And none of them will ever have it. None of them. Because they're not going to, that's why we took 2009 to do this. No one, if they haven't done it now, they're not going to add 1,600 people in that, like we have done to do this. It's very expensive. So it's, a, it's one of these rare sustainable competitive advantages. And if they wanted to add on the equivalent of our size business, 1,600 people, they couldn't source the, the, the experienced talent. And, and that was the other advantage. We were able to source it from our own divisions that we actually consolidated. So former buyers from our Macy's San Francisco division moved to Phoenix to help set up the district structure here. And so we had that all over the country. So the, num the, the actual investment plus the talent well, it, is one of those advantages that we're, we, we know is, is, uh, is a, a rare and unique sustain sustainable advantage in the department store industry. Um, and then how we take this to the next level is a company called Dunhumby. Uh, and Dunhumby is a technology company that they, 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 they do all of this consumer insight work. And they, they, what they do is they, they, they study millions of bits of data and, and determine based on consumer behavior, individual consumer behavior, what you're more, most likely to, to purchase in the future. And, and, and then we help, uh, that helps us direct our marketing toward you and the things that you would want to buy in the future. So if you're shopping, if you're a guy and you're shopping in home and men's, men's uh, clothing or men's sportswear, you know, and, and you know, in the past, retailers would send you, you know, women's apparel books because you're a good customer, you know, so, so uh, or, or a book with a lot of different products in it that are completely irrelevant to you. And with this technology that we now, now have, we're going to know that understand that and we're going to be able to version our books and customize our books very specifically just aimed at you. And, and so we, we, this last month, we, you know, where we normally do about five different versions, we do one for the, the warm weather climate like Florida, we do one, and then we do another one for the, 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 the northern storage where it's a little cooler temperature between transitioning. Now we're, we, last month we did 4,000 versions of one catalog. You know, we, we, we send out, we, we send out, you know, five million books, you know, when we send them out. So we did 4,000 versions now of these catalogs. So we can really tailor them now to your interest in the things that, that, that are, you're, you're more, more likely to buy and the like. And I'll give you another example of this Dunhumby, which is very cool stuff. You know, so, so one example is that they, they've discovered that if you buy Clinique Cosmetics, and you buy the foundation product from Clinique Cosmetics. Within 10 days, a very large percent of you who bought Clinique foundations will buy earrings. <laughs> now, does that make any sense to you? 
because at first I said, what are you talking about? They buy earrings. You know, I thought you were going to say buy lipstick or something like that. But they buy earrings and, and you know, you start thinking about it and you think, well, okay, you're, you're looking in the mirror, you're put, you know, doing, you're watching the beauty makeup artist has just put, you know, the product on you and all this. And, and I could use some new earrings. Uh, and so it kind of all kind of com comes together. And so within, you know, 10 days we have like half, half of the people, half of the women who bought Clinique Cosmetic, half bought earrings from us. So, you know, hello, send them an earring catalog if they buy cosmetics from us in, in a foundation cosmetic. And so there's so much opportunity we think that we can take from here in, the, in these learnings uh, of Dunhumby and it's just getting started. So we think that at the end of this year we'll have great, great data and by 2011 11, it's going to be just take my Macy's like on steroids like to the next, the next level. Uh, Listening to the customer is what we're trying to do. That's what my Macy's is is all about. It's it's the, it's the single biggest imperative, you know, for our, for our company. I've declared myself as the chief uh, customer officer for the uh, and, and and by that I mean that I will make sure at all major decisions that we make that the customer's is, is, her, her voice or his voice is heard first. And so it's not just an expense idea that's going to negatively impact the customer, but we're going to evaluate every single thing that we do and make sure we're listening to the customer. We can do that better than ever with these 1,600 people that are now close to the selling floor and getting this, capturing this data from, from our, our best sales associates and from our, from our, from our customers. And, uh, and, and so continuing to stay very focused on the customer is key. Some of the learnings are, you know, first the, 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 the power of, the, of, the, of, of my Macy's is just, you know, becoming more and more obvious. The fact that the, 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 the 20 original stores we tested and tried outperformed the rest of the, of the nation and continued to do that all through the fourth quarter of last year uh, was clear to me. 13 out of 15, uh, best out of 69 were in this group, 12 out of 12. You know, really, really clear, clear evidence. And as I said, no computer program can tell you what the customer came in and asked for yesterday and you didn't have. Yeah, that's got to come back to you in a, in a, in a human uh, contact way. Second uh, is, is, you know, what we, what we do now is, is in these, with these district teams, we ask these district merchants and these diff, district planners, again, these are former buyers, many of them, former planners, these guys have a lot of great experience. And so they're in, they get it, you know, they really understand what you can do in the stores. And so they're, they're, they're evaluating, you know, what is the white space? In other words, I've got customers coming in looking for this zone of product. I've got customers, 18 to 25 year old young women coming in to the, and, and, and they're looking for these brands or they're looking for these styles and we're not representing those well. How do we address that? And so we're defining what the opportunities are by store and then going, sending that information back to New York and then New York said, I've got to go after and find that, fill that void. How do I feel? So it's, it's kind of really coming from the consumer and instead of the buyers just going in the market and pushing it out to the stores, it's really coming from the consumer in the stores into the central organization for the central organization to respond to. And because of our size, because of the fact that we're the largest customer for almost every brand that you, would, you could think of that we would do, do business with, whether it's Ralph Lauren or, or, or Clinique or Estee Lauder or Mac or Coach or you, you name them, we're the, by far the largest seller of all these brands for them anywhere in the world, that they, they, they're coming to us and saying, you know, maybe I can just do business at Macy's and, and change the whole economic model. You know, get supply and demand back, you know, in line once again, and create the, you know, more demand by limiting the supply. And in fact, that's exactly what happened with Tommy Hilfiger. Tom, we're, you, the only place you can find Tommy Hilfiger is in a couple of stores that he has, a freestanding Tommy Hilfiger stores, and at Macy's. And, and, and we do more business with Tommy Hilfiger than Tommy Hilfiger did when he sold to 25 different companies uh, in, in America three years ago. So you know, we, we prioritized it, we made a big deal out of it, we advertised more of it, you know, he's aggressive about it, and, and that, that, that model of supply and demand in check really does in fact work. Rachel Roy, who's actually speaking at our she is fabulous and she's just a great designer. And Rachel Roy, she sells $500 blouses at Bergdorf Goodman. I mean, she, she makes $2,000, $2,500 jackets. Beautiful product. So she came to us and we talked and I said, that's very interesting. I have zero customers who can afford that. And, and so 
we, we, <laughs> my wife might buy my, my, that, but that's it. And, and so we said we need to do something very, very different. Long story short, and they, they, they came with that idea. They, she has a fabulous product line for young contemporary women, you know, really hitting this 20 to 20 to 30 year old age group, uh, you know, for $50 blouses, $70 blouses, and, and $100 jackets. It is fantastic product, selling like crazy. It's only sold at Macy's. Kenneth Cole just announced he's taking his whole entire reaction line, young men contemporary, only going to be sold at Macy's. Martha Stewart, no longer is available at Kmart, it's only available at, at Macy's today. Um, just announced Ellen Tracy. We just signed a deal last week with Madonna, uh, you know, and Madonna, it was really based more like on Lourdes, her, her teenage daughter, who's very fast, very much in the, in the news and the fashion world for young people. We wanted a young brand, young contemporary junior sportswear uh, brand, and it's going to be called Material Girl, which makes, uh, makes sense. Uh, <laughs> So we're, we get, but all these things are com coming our way, and they're and, and they're coming to us. Also, is beyond brands is categories. So you know, as you get around to these stores, you know, you, I was in Provo, Utah, you know, not too long ago, and they said, you know, Mr. Lundgren, we we we, we sell all these all of these products and they're really great, but did you realize that the average household in Provo, Utah has six children? I said, what? No, I didn't know that. Six children. I don't think anybody had six. I, I have six children. My, 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 I have four sis two sisters who are here. I have four sisters and a, and a brother. My family has six children, and I have two. One of my daughters, daughters is here. Uh, but I don't know anybody had six children anymore. Provo, the average is six children. So how do we address that? You need bigger pots and pans. You need big, <laughs> big serving you know, devices in, in Provo, Utah. So, I mean, that's a My Macy's story. We didn't, we didn't figure that out in New York. We wouldn't know anything about this, you know. So, this is, this is all this detailed, you know, this, 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 this Fleur de Lis. They want this in New Orleans. They want this on jeans. They want this on caps. They want this on everything. It's a New, York, New, it's a, it's a New Orleans Saints you know, logo, but this Fleur de Lis is everywhere in New Orleans. You can't sell that in Tucson, right? But you got to have it in New Orleans. You know, and so, and, and the shoe to shoe thing was in Chicago. They said, we need our customers taking up this log. And the sales associate says, Mr. Lungan, I got 25 requests for size 11 women's shoes. And size 11? I said, I wear size 11 shoes. <laughs> they said, no, women's shoes. They said, women's shoes. Said, okay, but now we have a whole table and a wall of size 11 shoes. And the whole shoe business went through the roof in, in Chicago. So getting this local knowledge, again, no computer talks about this stuff. You know, what customers are asking for. It's all about the human touch, that's a huge, huge change for us. And a lot of this stuff that we're filling with our, our private brand work. And then the next third advantage is, is just the, the, the pure, pure size. You know, as I said, you know, three years ago, I did, I did all this changing, you know, of these years of things that went, went by. We just changed the name to Macy's to these, all these 800 stores three years ago. We've only been a national brand for three years. You know, it seems like maybe f forever. It's been three years. And, and so only three years ago, we first advertised on the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is always like my pet peeve. You know, we couldn't advertise on the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. They didn't have stores in half the cities, you know, across America. And now, and now of course, we're in, in most major cities. So, so um, that, that the size itself is, it re really does matter. And a lot of, none of these, these exclusive brands would be, would be possible without our size because the vendor has to, ha, you know, has to, has to be, uh, make enough money and, and be big enough you know, in terms of the business uh, for them to, then to make sense, for it to make sense for them. And so, so uh, in fact, our size helps that. And then the fourth, I love this. Okay, so this is, I, I'm going to a store in, in Tampa and, and I go into the store employee entrance and this is at the employee entrance. It's, it says, you know, this is my Macy's. And so what the store manager, you know, said, is she had this white board and she, she started writing this stuff down and says, okay guys, look, you asked for, your, you said you could sell North Face if we got it. North Face, it's here now. You know, Rachel Roy, you said you wanted a contemporary, you wanted Rachel Roy, it's here now. Go down the, get, get down the list of all these different brands and, and categories of, of, of product, and it's either here now or it's updated that it's, it's coming. Now let's sell it. And, I, and to me, that is the, the, one of the big keys here of our learnings is that it's, so, so they ask for it, and all of a sudden we get it for them, and all of a sudden they own it. Now, now they own it in the store. So now they're saying, oh, holy crap, I asked for this stuff. Now I got to sell it. I better sell it or they're going to kill me. You know, and, we're, and of course we're not going to kill them, but, well, I don't know. They <laughs> like to. 
I'd like to. No, no, the thing is, is that if, if, they, if they ask for it, I, I, I tell my, my, my central group, central buyers and planners all the time, I say, you know, when, it, when, when they ask for it, and when, you, when, when in doubt, just say yes. <laughs> just agree, because what have you got to lose? We, there's no possible way we can have this local intelligence sitting in, in, in New York City. We've got the big buying power, and you've got all your vendors that are all in New York. This is great. You go to the market. We don't have this local information. They've got it. Let them have it. Give them the inventory. Give them what they want. And if they don't sell it, you know, then they, they're the ones that are going to get stuck. If they do sell it, you're going to want to give them more and listen more and respond more. And so it, there's a re, it's a really a fantastic cycle of events that takes place um, with this whole My Macy's initiative. And then five is certainly, I say, people are the advantage. And that is, in fact, the big advantage. But technology is key. And, and we, at the same time in 2009, I spent a ton of money on technology. Because the same thing, I said, you know what? I'm gonna, we're, we're not going to be building a lot of stores because the developers aren't building malls, so let's take all that money I would have spent on building stores and put it all into technology. And, and, and it's, we'll have new systems that will do our allocation, new systems that do our storefront planning, new systems that will communicate from these district teams into the central organization, a, a, a vendor portal so our vendors, at the same time that, the, that our buyer sees how, how the product is selling, our vendors can now see how the product is selling because we want to share, you know, share that responsibility so they can be looking at all of these opportunities and feeding us with information. So big, big investment in technology and, and I, I feel really, really good about those investments. And then six is, is, uh, you know, is, is keeping that customer at the center of these decisions, never forgetting that, making sure that we're really, really validating our, our decisions on product and on purchasing and the like on, on, on the consumer. Uh, and, uh, and when we add the Dunhumby insights coming in this fall season and, be, and beyond, I think that takes that again to this, to this next, uh, next level. So that's my Macy's basically in a, in a nutshell and some of the things that we've learned uh, so far. If you can't tell, I'm pretty en enthusiastic about it. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I feel like, you know, it's been something I've been doing for a long, long time and yet I just feel like I'm just like you. I'm just graduating, you know. I'm just, just beginning to understand the real potential here of, of responding to what, you know, our consumers are are, um, are wanting from us and it's, it's almost back really to when I, when I started as my example that I gave when I, I really felt like I, as a buyer, I really knew a lot about our, what our customers wanted uh, because I was really connected and in, in the stores and, 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 and deeply involved in that way and it was an easy communication process because there's only 20 stores. And so I feel like we're kind of getting, getting some of that back but now with this national powerful brand being the largest seller of all of, all of the brands that, that, that we sell gives us a whole set of additional advantages that otherwise we just uh, we, we just would not we just would not have had. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, how was our time? Fine. We're good. Okay, so we're done at one. Great. So I got time for questions. Twelve minutes, in fact. Who has a question? Yes. What has the reaction been for your private labels since 2008? Uh, the private, private, private label, which we now call private brand, and the re and it, and it, but the reaction has been very, very positive. It was the best as a group. It was the best performing product we had in the store last year. Part of that is because of value, but but part of it is because it's just right, you know. And and, and we we uh, we have our, our largest uh, women's apparel brand in the store is INC Inc. Um, and it is uh, it is probably target customers 35 35 year old customer a uh, women's customer um, uh, and uh, contemporary. Um, and it's almost a half a billion dollars, you know, in just uh, women's, uh, women's apparel. Then we do a hundred million dollars in men's ink, you know, young men contemporary brand. So, you know, we, we do these private brands and consumers, most consumers don't know that it's, it's private label. They just think, you know, you got Ralph Lauren, you got Tommy Hilfiger, you got ink. 
<laughs> and, uh, and so we advertise it in fashion magazines and we have selling associates that wear the clothes, you know, and we, we really treat it like a brand. And so I really think that's become a big part of it. And today, the, the products we make ourselves and source ourselves is about a $4 billion business uh, and, uh, and growing. Growing, growing. It, it's, it continues to be this year the fastest growing part of our overall business, and very profitable. Yes. I was just curious when you said 2009 was a bad. Uh, what is your prediction of 2010 and so on? 2009. I say 2009 was a bad year. I, I, I will tell you this. I'm really glad it's over, uh, but I'm really glad I went through it because it was a phenomenal learning experience for me and for my organization and to go through all of these major, major changes. And I just touched on them. They, they were, if you ask people in my organization if we went through some changes, they would say, oh yeah, let me tell you, get, give me buy you a drink because we got about an hour to go, go through it. Uh, but we went through a lot and it was major, major, major change. Uh, and while we did and we, and we lost sales versus the prior year like every, everybody did, our earnings were actually very good. And so we ended up having a very good year financially. Having said that, um, 2010 will definitely be better. Uh, definitely be better on sales and definitely be better in earnings. Um, we have uh, um, forecast that, you know, we've already forecast nice double digit uh, uh, earnings growth uh, for the year and we've, uh, we've forecast uh, sales growth and moderate sales growth you know f for the year we already beat that uh, f forecast for the first month and you'll read tomorrow how we did uh, last month it's not public until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, but you know you'll read that and so you know it it's it, it just I mean this time last year I don't you, you guys don't even remember your parents were all like you know blowing their brains out this time last year because they were just thinking you know I've got I've got my 401k, you know, I was planning on retirement, my house value has just been, been lowered. I mean, it really impacted just about everybody. And, and you just feel today that we've, we've kind of lived through the, the difficulty and the challenges and at least now, while the, there's still these difficult, ta difficult you know, economic uh, situations out there with unemployment and the like, you at least can see how to plan it. You know, you, 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 people like us, I took $400 million of expense out of the company in the last two years. So, you know, if I can just now grow sales on that, boy, there's a lot of potential earnings uh, available, available to us. And so other companies have done the exact same thing. And so we've, we've, we've learned to live with less. You know, we've learned to live uh, with, with a, ti a tighter, uh, a tighter you know, rein on, on expenses and on inventory. My inventory is down 5%, you know, and, I, and, and that's on top of being down 5% a year before. So, I'm, you know, I can live with less now. And, and it's, so that's why I say many of the things that we learned from 2009 were very positive. Who else has a question? Uh, in the back row. Yeah, I'm from Chicago and my First of all, I am so happy you brought this up because, <laughs> and a year ago I would not be happy if you brought this up, but I, I actually have some statistics to back it up today. Uh, this is a great example because um, Marshall Fields was a very well-known brand, very popular brand in Chicago. And, and it expanded, they changed the names of, of stores in, in um, Minneapolis, which was a very powerful brand called Dayton's, to Marshall Fields, and it never really did much there. They changed the name of Hudson's, which is a great store in Detroit, to Marshall Fields, and never really did much. They tried to expand to Texas, they closed those stores. They tried to expand to Columbus, they closed those stores. So the Marshall Field brand was a powerful name in Chicago, but not expandable. That was, that, that was just based on what had happened before we, we, we got involved with the company. So, but I knew it was a very sensitive issue because of people like your grandmother. Because, now, and every single, and I, what I promised was that every time I got a letter or an email or a phone call from someone, I would check their spending at Marshall Fields because I had five years of data 
of, of how much they had spent. And every person that spent more than $100 in the last five years, I would personally call them. I made three phone calls. I, and, you know, 50% of our business is done on, on Macy's card, Bloomingdale's card, and the Marshall Fields card. So they can't all tell me they're all cash customers. You know, so there was such, such a little relationship between the emotion and the, the, the actual purchasing in the stores. There was tremendous emotion attached to it. And I know that and I have a, a lot of respect for that. But I also knew that we were, gonna, we were gonna advertise in say Macy's everywhere except Chicago. You know, and it didn't, you know, we weren't gonna do that of course. It didn't make any sense. And so it was from a, if you looked at the business which had been performing poorly, it was an easy decision. If you looked at the emotion, it was very hard. And so that is a great example, but I'm happy to say say of my top four communities of the 69 cities in America, the two districts in Chicago were number two and number four in the nation. I mean, we worked at this. Yeah, I was determined to make sure Chicago were, performed well. But I'm really happy to say I put my, put my best people living in Chicago, moved them to Chicago, uh, and, it, and it be, it, it, we really turned that business around. It was a very, very good story, and my business continues to be very strong in Chicago, February, March, so far this year. So thanks for the question. <laughs> uh, someone else, yes? Good question. Are we going to talk about Okay, and re our rest of work. Um, I don't really know that much about sales for customers either. It seems like, in general, in retail the last couple of years, the buyers got into such a sale after sale after sale mentality. With my Macy's, are you seeing more um, first time full price sales? What are you seeing from a pricing standpoint? Yeah, for, first of all, as you go down this that scale of retailers, the higher end you go, the more full price business there is. So if you go to Neiman Marcus or if you go to Saks Fifth, it wasn't true in 2009, but you know, typically if you go to those stores, you're, gonna, you're more likely to pay full price. Uh, and if you go down to Walmart, it's every day low price. It's basically the sale price every single day, every, 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 every single item. That's sort of the range of, of things. Macy, Bloomingdale's is much less promotional than, than Macy's. Macy's is much less promotional than, than uh, uh, like a, a, the, lower, the lower end uh, tier stores, but still a promotional department store. Part of our, 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 our marketing uh, messaging is, uh, is, is promotion. If you, if you buy Ralph Lauren, if you're like we, we do, uh, Ralph Lauren, name any kind of brand, there's a cycle to fashion. Okay, so, so you buy it, and you, and you sell it for 60 days at the full price, sometimes 90 days. If it's, if it's a great seller, it stays for probably 90 days. But then the new merchandise delivery is coming in. Seasons are changing, fashion's changing, colors are changing, and so you mark that down. And that's what we promote. So, so in, our si in our business, in the fashion business like we're in, there will always be promotion. Always, um, and so it's just a matter of how you do it. In the case of uh, of Bloomingdale's, we just end up selling a bigger percent at full price. They buy less. They buy. They sell a bigger percent at full price. And at the, at the, in the in the Macy's model, they end up having more to sell at off price. But because we're such a big customer, the vendors work with us very very well, and it becomes profitable for them and for us. So it'll always be a a part of the the, the Macy's model as part of promotion. Um, as far as my Macy's is concerned, I think it's probably too early to say that there's any big shift or change in regard to regular price sell-through uh, versus, uh, versus promotional sell-through. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to explore. I do think as we, as we have less inventory, that there's a better chance for more sales at regular price because it's just going to be gone. And that's what I've, we've, we've told customers in, the, in, in uh, 2010 and even the fourth quarter 2009, we had, we had all retailers had so much more inventory than we needed in the first half of 2009 because it all, everything hit the wall in the fourth quarter of 2008 and we had inventory coming, the boats, I said sink the boats, you know, because the boats are coming over, sink the boats. But, but it, the inventory was coming because we, we buy six months in advance, Mostly, most of apparel is about six months in advance. And so you really couldn't do much about it. 
Uh, it was coming. That's why all the discount stores did well because they got all fresh inventory last year. <laughs> we just turned it away and it went right to the TJX's and all of those guys. So those guys did great last year. That fresh inventory and the, and the vendors were, were marking it way down, you know, to make it, you know, sell just to get rid of it. Uh, and now the, the, it's all reversed and all changed because now there's much leaner inventories, less inventory, and, and the idea is, is that there'll be less available when you come in for your size six or size eight or whatever it is. And so if you don't buy it at full price, you may not get it at all. You may not get it on sale, you may not get it at all. I think that's it. I'm getting the hook from, uh, from Kimberly. Thank you. Thanks very much.